Hello, everyone. My name is Sabrina Fitzig. I'm a physician assistant uh, from Penn Sports Medicine here at the University of Pennsylvania. And happy APP week to all those PAs and MPs uh, listening. So today I'm going to talk to you about advances in uh, cartilage repair surgery and specifically Macy. I am a uh, paid consultant from Vericell um, and I have no other uh, financial disclosures. So um, what is uh, Macy? So Macy is an autologous uh, cellularized scaffold product indicated for the repair of symptomatic single or multiple full thickness cartilage defects with or without bone involvement um, in adults. And it has uh, been stu not studied over the patients in the age of 55. The amount of the Macy that we're going to be using and talking about depends on the size of the lesion, and that's me measured in areas uh, in area squared. Um, when we talk a little bit more about the Macy, um, it's a, a collagen membrane that's going to be trimmed to the size and shape of the de defect uh, in the knee, and the cells are implanted with the, that side down. If you want uh, more information regarding this, uh, you can uh, follow the package insert uh, located uh, in, in the Macy. So a couple more things about uh, important safety information regarding Macy. It's uh, indicated for uh, patients who um, have, have a cartilage defect, uh, ones that are under the age of 55 and are able to follow physician-directed uh, rehab. Um, another thing, too, is that um, patients, uh, in or those who are going to be able to follow this rehab, also can have had surgery in the past six months, but this doesn't include the surgery uh, used for taking the biopsy. Uh, so with more uh, regards to uh, the Macy, um, we want to kind of create a favorable environment for implantation. That is, uh, any patients that have contaminant um, pathology, such as meniscal deficiency, ACL tears, or other malalignment of the knee, those are things we want to uh, correct during the time of surgery uh, of implantation. So um, Macy, again, is used in patients over the age of 18 and under the age of 55. Um, the, the summit trial uh, demonstrated a, a great safety profile, and it didn't show any unexpected adverse uh, events. So what am I going to be talking to you about today? Um, first, we're going to talk about cartilage injuries and treatment options. Um, regarding cartilage defects, kind of what is a cartilage defect. Um, then we're going to talk about what exactly Macy is, um, how it's uh, implanted in the operating room, um, and some evidence in the rehab to support uh, how well Macy does. And last part I'm going to talk to you about is um, how do we get this procedure approved for patients? Um, how do we get them from our office to the OR table and uh, create a smooth insurance approval process? So. What is a cartilage defect? Um, it's a full thickness uh, lesion um, that doesn't really have a good ability to heal. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, um, the pink is uh, a grade four lesion down to bone. And what I often say to patients is that this is a uh, kind of like a pothole on a good road. The knee is a good road, the cartilage that uh, surrounds it, and that there's just this one area that's symptomatic, so kind of like the pothole. Over time, we know that potholes um, become, small potholes become larger potholes and um, can lead to more serious uh, degenerative joint conditions. Oftentimes, too, if patients get a little confused about what a focal articular cartilage defect may be, I tell them that it's kind of like a hangnail. You know, you, you brush over the hangnail one way, and it doesn't hurt, and then when you catch that edge, that's kind of like what's happening with delaminating cartilage in the knee. So uh, what happens to a person with a cartilage defect over time? We know that with no treatment um, that these defects get worse, pay, uh, pain increases and function decreases, and that with cartilage treatment, that patients have very good success, um, you know, after treatment. And you can also see that uh, this yellow line here, that patients may not be okay modifying their activity. And for someone who's young and wants to get back to a high level of activity, um, you know, it's not reasonable to tell them to just go, you know, sit down and watch TV or play chess and not get back to the prior level of activity and sports that they may want to. So there are several ways that we treat cartilage defects. The, probably the most uh, basic is uh, palliative treatment, a chondroplasty, debriding all those loose edges. Next one is a more reparative treatment uh, known as microfracture, which uh, some of you may do as well, um, where we uh, perforate the bone uh, to stimulate um, the marrow elements to come down and fill the cartilage defect. 
And then the last three treatments here you see are more restorative treatments, the first being the osteochondral autograft, borrowing from one part of the knee and implanting into uh, the defect, an osteochondral allograft where we take cartilage, from, uh, cartilage and bone from a cadaver and implant it. And the last one, which we'll be talking about uh, for the remainder of the presentation today, is MACI, the autologous cultured chondrocytes that are on a porcine collagen membrane. So um, this slide's got a lot going on, um, but this treatment algorithm, it shows that MACI fits uh, this treatment algorithm as the primary treatment option for patients with lesions over two centimeters squared and for those who want to return uh, to a high active lifestyle. And you can see that MACI does uh, relatively well as a primary treatment. So what is uh, MACI? So MACI is the first FDA approved product that uses the patient's own cells to be implanted back into the knee. And it helps treat these symptomatic cartilage defects. Um, in fact, you can see that uh, that's exactly how the membrane comes in the, in the OR, this third generation product, um, when it's to be implanted. There's about 500,000 to a million cells per square centimeter. Um, this is very important actually when this comes to the OR for those of you who have implanted or maybe haven't implanted yet, to kind of keep that um, container very level so that the Macy um, doesn't float around, get rolled up, um, and sometimes it can be hard to tell which side is, uh, has the cells and which side doesn't, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. So um, I just was speaking about the, this dual-sided implant. There's a rough side and a smooth side. So you always want to put the um, rough, the cell side down. One easy way I remember that is just simply by the alphabet C, uh, CD, cells down, and it's an easy way for uh, you and the surgeon to remember it during the time. Um, of surgery. So how do we get these patients um, treated with MACI? So you identify this defect by MRI uh, in clinic and then you set them up for their first arthroscopic surgery in which um, we take this biopsy. Um, so this biopsy is taken usually from a non-weight, it should be taken from a non-weight bearing portion of the knee. Uh, oftentimes we take it from the far lateral trochlea but the intercondylar notch also works as a good um, biopsy site. Um, you know, Macy goes through uh, a lot of uh, testing, this biopsy, to make sure that we have the safest uh, uh, way to get these cells back to us. Um, the, the lab's located up in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it goes through extensive uh, release testing. Um, so the next slide here is kind of, kind of what happens in the operating room. So when you're in the operating room, the defects assessed, you've already kind of seen it at the first uh, biopsy. And uh, one thing here, uh, it has to be done through an arthrotomy, meaning this uh, procedure must be done open in a dry environment because this, the glue that we use, which I'll get into at the very end, uh, to seal off the defect is water soluble. Then the template is size and shape to match the defect. Um, you know, oftentimes people use a, a glove wrapper or some sort of other paper uh, that may be available uh, on the operating room table, but um, what I like to do in my experience, I like to use a colored suture packet actually. You'll see that the template here, um, this one might be a fiber wire template, it's uh, silver. Uh, I find that biotin, which is red in ROR, and cat gut, which is yellow. Uh, tend to work out as a great implant and you can kind of press fit it right over the defect almost as if you were to take like a penny and uh, kind of emboss that on paper. These aluminum colored foil packets work really great. Um, one thing that's not also shown in here, what we do in the OR is I like to take this um, aluminum now template that we have and I get a piece of Tegaderm and a label from the operating room uh, like where you would label saline or lidocaine or something. Uh, I like to take those labels and fold them on itself, like kind of if you were to put a bow on a package. I take that, um, that label, I stick it to the Tegaderm, and on top of that, I'll put this template that the doctor just cut out. And I'm kind of doing that on the back table while he's preparing the defect. And um, that way that our template won't float around. And then um, I talked before about that uh, the Macy is delivered in this uh, little container. That should be opened up on a flat level table. Um, believe it or not, it looks, it's a quarter turn, but that um, container can be really hard to open. Uh, so I like to do on a flat level surface and 
if you're with a nurse that you work with a lot, they're a great resource to open, or sometimes I'll just um, put it on a sterile table like a mayo stand and open that up uh, myself. So then um, the Macy patch is a uh, collagen membrane is put over the uh, colored suture packet, and then the doctor can cut it to size. He then takes that um, template and places it into the defect. Um, oftentimes, we'll put, uh, before we place it, we'll put a layer of fibrin sealant on there, and then we'll place the Macy uh, on top of that in the correct orientation based upon uh, the defect size, and um, it's press fit into the defect. Um, after that, we'll put a little bit of glue around the perimeter of the defect and hold gentle pressure there. Now, the, the guidelines say that it doesn't need to be sewn into the defect, but oftentimes we'll put some suture in the corners just to secure it. It's a very expensive implant. Um, I would hate to float, have it float away or something like that. We've obviously never had that happen, and the glue works great. But I think some extra sutures like we did um, with the second generation product uh, of ACI uh, just gives us a little bit more insurance that um, it'll stay in place. So uh, now just to talk about the healing process, the, this uh, Macy implant allows cells to fill into the defect. Um, it integrates with the bone and the adjacent cartilage and becomes excellent repair tissue. The post-operative healing process actually begins within the first 48 hours. And, you know, over the course of the year, this matrix continues to expand and fill the defect, and it's a great way to have, uh, you know, your own cartilage cells uh, fix the defect and it's excellent repair tissue. So uh, in this timeline here, a uh, couple things going on. Basically, the time from biopsy to actual implant is usually about three to four months. What I usually tell patients is that if they want to go soon, that um, I'll sign them up for the second stage procedure, the implant, um, at their first post-operative visit following their arthroscopy. So. Um, basically, and I tell them at this point that not to pick a surgery date with our surgical scheduler any sooner than six weeks from the day that I sign them up for this implant. This allows um, three or four weeks. It's usually for insurance approval. That tends to hold this up. And then one membrane takes about 15 days to grow. So if you kind of round up, six weeks seems to be a safe um, amount of time uh, from biopsy to implantation. On this next uh, slide, uh, mostly talking about the rehabilitation of after Macy implantation, I think what's best to take away from this slide is that the immediate post-operative period is uh, very important to talk to with your patients about. The first six weeks are critical. They're, it's a time of crutches, brace, weight limiting, uh, weight bearing restrictions. Um, oftentimes during this, uh, for as many of our adult patients, they can't drive. So it's a huge assault to your autonomy. So um, that's something that you want to talk to your patients about, um, making sure that they have the support around them so that um, they can get through those first six weeks uh, without any hiccups. Um, in the middle, uh, well, in the middle uh, of the rehabilitation protocol, it's usually not until like about seven, eight weeks out that patients start feeling like normal people again. They're walking around without crutches. They're face brace free. And then what patients often ask me is that, when can I get back to running or jogging? We define impact activities as anything that is jogging and beyond. Now, they're doing things all along the way, like cycling. They're able to walk limitlessly. There's a portion where you can introduce some pool exercises sooner um, than the six to nine months. But basically, uh, jogging and beyond kind of starts at uh, eight months. And for sports and return to full activity, uh, about a year is a safe safe bet. So uh, is there clinical evidence to support Macy working? Yes. Macy is the only cartilage repair uh, product that's approved by the FDA based on a phase three uh, clinical trial. Um, this study was based upon a co-primary endpoint that where pain and function had to be significantly better than uh, to achieve a primary goal. So response rates at two years. Actually, 87.5% of patients uh, uh, had an excellent response rate at two years. You can see that both um, uh, this extrapolates over to lesions over four centimeters, medial femoral condyles, uh, and defects that were not OCD. So basically, this answers the question, can patients return uh, to an active lifestyle? Yes, they can. 
Um, the summit trial um, showed that results for each treatment at two years were sustained at five years. So clearly we can see that patients who received Macy versus microfracture were still doing better at five years out. Um, their pain had uh, decreased and their function continues to increase. So it's good to see that we're, they were still reporting success at five years out. So on this next slide, of course, any surgery has, uh, you know, it's not free of adverse events. But actually in the summit trial, it showed uh, that um, there were very, there were no uh, adverse reactions following this. There were no a uh, unexpected adverse reactions, and that Macy has a strong safety profile. One thing that's actually not listed here, um, which happens that we see commonly in practice, and maybe for those of you that are doing a lot of Macy, um, we're seeing some hypertrophy still with the third generation product. Now, it's much less than when we were doing it with the second generation product, the ACI, but hypertrophy does still um, occur. And the way we present it to patients in clinic is actually kind of, uh, you know, not even that we need to spin it in a good light, that I often tell patients, you know what, you grew uh, your cartilage repair tissue too well. It's kind of often like a, you can think like a muffin growing over the foil, or it's kind of like a blister on your foot. Patients will often report to you um, pain uh, with activity, um, especially like more vigorous activity. We usually see this like six, seven, eight months out. It's not really in the first three months. Patients are going to tell you that there's they have some pain, some clicking, some popping. A lot of that is just post-surgical stuff and very common within the first three months, so I reassure them that this is normal. But worrisome signs that we also see with hypertrophy is um, clicking, popping, uh, some sort of catching in the knee that is associated with pain. And oftentimes I tell patients that, um, you know, though this is unwanted, um, it in, is frustrating. Sometimes it does happen and that all that is required for treatment may be a second chondroplasty to smooth that articular cartilage that's overgrown back to the contour, the normal contours of the knee. And in terms of recovery, I tell them usually it may be about a three-week uh, setback on where they were in the protocol, um, but that it's probably only going to be two to three days of crutches, again, much like their first surgery um, for biopsy. So again, um, getting the best uh, surgical outcome, I think, is uh, basically preparing our patients for what uh, is about to happen to them. The rehab following Macy is certainly a marathon and not a sprint. As you can see on this slide, it's delineated out, um, you know, for about a year. I can't also harp again enough on the importance of the first six weeks following surgery. That's kind of the most critical time. We want to make sure the patient's pain is under control, um, that they're able to get around with their crutches and brace safely. And oftentimes I'll give uh, patients a copy of the protocol preoperatively so that they know what to expect, we know what to expect, their physical therapist knows what to expect, and that everybody's on the same page. Again, um, you know, kind of basic stuff the first six weeks, crutches, braces, uh, motion, uh, range of motion precautions and weight-bearing precautions, um, and that's the most critical time. Uh, one thing, too, I'd like to mention, especially in regards to rehab, um, you know, most patients, even with good insurances, don't have unlimited amount of visits. So one thing I uh, try to educate our patients on is being educated on what their health plan covers. You know, it's, surgery is not the, it, obviously it's important to have our patients implanted with, uh, with the Macy, but the recovery after is just as important. Certain patients will only have 20 to 30 visits per year, so it's important that they communicate this protocol to the physical therapist because, again, the first six weeks are critical in getting your range of motion back, making sure that you can ambulate safely, but I often tell patients between months four, five, six, when it's mostly just some floor-based strengthening, things they can do on their own, that they should get a good um, home program from their physical therapist, and then at that point, they can um, kind of save their formal visits for when they get into the return to recreational activities. You can see around the six to nine month mark. Well, they need more specific physical therapy guidance again about assessing their hip strength, their quad strength more formally so that they can return to the activities that they like um, in a safe manner. On this next slide again, talking about matching patient expectations with the reality of the rehab process. Uh, a uh, famous surgeon uh, performing Macy, Dr. Tom Minus, once said that the best uh, outcomes are achieved by those who are aware 
of the rehab milestones and uh, of the rehab milestones and are mentally prepared. Again, setting the expectations I think is very important. Uh, one thing, one reason why I like Macy so much, other than that, uh, the, the outcomes are great. It's uh, you know substantial, uh, substantially good rep cartilage repair tissue to fill these defects. Is that it allows patients this procedure to time it at a at a period of time in their lives where they'll have a lot of support. Now, support for our students, our, our college athletes or uh, college students who are getting that, you know, they need to be, make sure they're caught up in class. Uh, you know, they're gonna have some downtime recovering in the first couple of weeks. Those who are working and adults, um, they may not be able to, their primary mode of getting into work may be driving. So they're gonna need to figure that out. Um, so having good family and friends support around you, even for the little things like, having someone to help you get things from the fridge or get stuff from upstairs, it's, uh, it's gonna be a workout on those crutches for six weeks and patients need to be prepared. And I think if you warn them up front that a lot of this will be tough, especially some of the, um, uh, our older patients, uh, you know, I think under 55, you're still pretty young, um, but they, not, they may not have great upper body strength and they're gonna be using crutches for six weeks um, and it could be uh, really tough on them. I think mo what most people uh, like is that we let them know about the driving. That's a big thing. Um, it's a huge, again, assault to your autonomy. You now have to kind of rely on other people to get you around. So um, being prepared for this surgery is great and being able to time it at a time when you do have that support uh, is even better for our patients. So. Uh, the last thing here I just want to talk about is that uh, Macy is a huge, uh, you know, we're a team. You know, there's, it's not only me or other NPs and PAs and my surgeon, but there's the rehab specialists, these physical therapists that need, that want to be just as involved in their care. And that's why when I had talked earlier, I think it's important to give a copy of the protocol to the patients, the rehab protocol, so that they can give it to the therapist. They probably already met their therapist at the first, um, after their first arthroscopy for the biopsy, so they're familiar with them. And, um, you know, therapists love having a specific protocol so that there's no gray area uh, with regards to recovery and what we can introduce at certain stages. Um, so a copy of that protocol is great uh, to give them as well. Also, one great source is my cartilage care. Every um, uh, patient is assigned to my cartilage care representative. Uh, ours is Erin, she's great, um, and she's the insurance guru, I often say. I can answer a lot of the clinical questions. At this point in uh, my career, I can actually answer a lot of the insurance questions because patients have a lot of questions regarding that. Um, and between myself, the patient, Erin, or my cartilage care rep, there's always constant clear lines of communication because you know, I may not know when a decision is going to take place for uh, from an insurance company, but I give um, you know our patients the uh, email and phone number to our my cartilage care reps so that they can have those questions answered seamlessly for them. So the last part of the presentation, kind of I think, may pertain to a lot of you guys who assist with the approval um, and the clinical stuff. So we're going to talk about how we actually get these patients approved uh, with Macy. So. The answer to uh, the question, will my insurance cover my treatment with Macy? Yes, but it may take some extra legwork on our part to get our patients approved for this procedure. Um, you know, my cartilage care has these case managers I mentioned that are they're specialists. They know the ins and outs of all the insurance companies. They know what points we need to hit in our clinical notes and our operative notes. And they're, they work to make sure that, you know, this procedure that's very expensive uh, for the insurance companies, patients should not see a bill for the cost of this procedure. That's stuff that goes through the hospital. That's stuff that's, um, you know, kind of taken care of in the, uh, like, behind the scenes. And I think that um, reminding our patients of this is, uh, is a comfort that, um, you know, we work hard to get them approved uh, for this procedure to help them. Um, so the... Macy is actually addressed in most insurance policies. Um, there are some that are off policy, and we'll get into that uh, in a second. But um, insurance policies, it's important that we match our operative notes to the medical policy guidelines. One um, resource I hadn't uh, used a lot in the beginning, but I think is paramount to success for patients getting approved, is actually going to mycartilagecare.com forward slash approval. There are so many resources on here, not only for you, for patients, and for your surgeon. There's a thing called the dictation roadmap, how to structure your operative notes. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you're unsure of what's 
the criteria is to have, make sure patients get approved for MACE, you can go on there. They have a tremendous amount of insurance plans, and it prints out actually a nice little PDF for you so you can make sure that um, your patient meets all the criteria so that um, hopefully the approval process for them for the second stage implantation is, uh, is seamless. So one example I have here is actually the uh, medical policy for Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. These are often things uh, on the right-hand side here you'll see that are, um, you know, criteria that span across many insurance companies. There'll be little uh, different nuances here. Uh, here and there, uh, some want lesion size over two centimeters squared. Some people uh, have a BMI guideline actually of under 35. So this is just one example, but, and obviously we don't want our patients to have severe osteoarthritis. We're treating potholes on a good road, not uh, when the whole cartilage is gone in the knee. And recently in my experience with the ICD-10 codes now, I actually like to use tear of articular cartilage right knee or tear of articular cartilage left knee. Um, that ICD-10 code is actually S83.32 XA or 0.31 XA, depending on the knee. And uh, I've had good success getting uh, patients approved with this um, ICD-10 code. So, um, you know, you submit a case, and what do we do if a patient gets denied? Um, I think one of the most important things we can do as mid-level providers is advocate for our patients on the medical side. And um, if you're unsure of how to start the appeal letter, uh, mycartilagecare.com actually has a good template where basically you want to start at the beginning of the letter, you know, basic information, patient name, date of birth, um, specific insurance numbers related to their plan, and that, you know, we want to fight for care for our patients for individualized care. Not everybody is this, fits into the cookie cutter uh, inclusion criteria that the insurance company may delineate. So I think that we need to write these letter of medical necessities to highlight the patient um, situation. One reason that uh, I, I like writing these letters is because they actually, the more you do, they end up being easier. Basically, we just want to write these letters and we want to state the facts. I like to start off by highlighting the first in the first paragraph, the individual clinical situation, how long they've been having pain, how their pain is affecting them, um, things like mechanical symptoms, like they're unable to perform activities of daily living because they're having uh, constant catching in their knee. And also on the MyCartilage Care website, there's lots of great literature on there to support why, you know, we know that Macy works well um, and articles that help legitimate uh, size the procedure and, you know, because these insurance companies who are reviewing them aren't necessarily all orthopedic surgeons. You might be getting uh, OBGYNs or uh, ENTs who may not be familiar with um, Macy. So uh, highlighting those bullet points in a letter of medical necessity um, is excellent for the patients. And, you know, what oftentimes with these younger patients, there is no better treatment. What if the patient wishes to use their own cartilage cells? They don't want to use an allograft and um, they have a lesion of the patella. What, what are we supposed to offer them when their you know, defect is over two centimeters squared? Um, Macy offers, uh, especially for the patella, for instance, I just mentioned, a great way to resurface the cartilage uh, for a younger patient who wants to get back to an active lifestyle. And I think just highlighting those key points in your letter uh, will go uh, a far way. So, um, you know, just to take away from this slide, um, most of you who are on this call from the Northeast are familiar with Amtrak. Obviously, a cell train is the fastest way from point A to point B. Those are our patients who are on the medical policy. And then uh, those who take the Northeast Regional train before, there's a couple stops along the way. Basically, what I take away from this slide is I tell the patients, especially in clinic, that, you know, we work hard for their desired date of implant, um, so, but there's no guarantee. So, you know, I think it's reassuring for patients to hear that, um, you know, we're well-versed, we have a team, my cartilage care, we have, you know, people working on the insurance side of things. We're working on uh, our side of things um, to help get the common goal of getting our patients implanted with, uh, you know, what we think is the best to help them in the future health of their knee. Um, so, after you submit a letter of medical necessity, um, or you may just uh, have already submitted a letter of medical necessity when you submitted the case, if you know that maybe this patient is off policy, maybe they're a, a patellar lesion that isn't um, uh, on the policy and you know you're going to get some kickback, oftentimes the insurance company will require a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. 
Um, this can be done by, uh, often they want an MD, NP, or PA to do this. I do the majority of our calls. They're actually not too bad to do. Um, basically, again, you just, when you talk to this medical director, you just want to introduce yourself, um, state who you are, and um, make sure that you guys are on the same page about why that patient was denied. Um, and, you know, I used to get, uh, you know, very fired up because I want our patients to get uh, the surgery that they're supposed to have. The first question I ask nowadays is, do you have the authority to overturn this decision? Oftentimes you won't be talking to, depending on the insurance company, you won't be talking to uh, an orthopedic surgeon who may be uh, unfamiliar with what you're talking about. Oftentimes you're talking to an internist, an ENT, and they just have to stick to the guidelines. So there's no point in you wasting your breath or getting upset that they're not understanding what you're saying and just saying, oh, this patient is on the guideline, we can't approve them. So I'd like to get that question out of the way. Do you have the ability to overturn it? If they don't, just say thank you and ask them how we take the next step and apply for the appeals process. And generally that's not another letter, another phone call, hopefully with a specialty reviewer like an orthopedic surgeon. In the event that you do get an orthopedic surgeon on the phone and he does have the ability to um, overturn it, um, you know, that's, that's great, it's better for you guys, uh, um, and hopefully you can just highlight that person's individual situation um, to get them approved. Uh, one thing I like to do is have the operative note in front of me. It's probably your most detailed source of information other than the operative notes that you can help speak to why this patient, um, you know, needs to get implanted with Macy, how it's affecting their life, and, um, you know, how they meet the medical criteria to move forward. Um, so other than us uh, advocating for our patients, you know, our my cartilage care reps advocating on the insurance side, um, I think one of the strongest voices you can have is that of the patient. Um, on the my cartilage care uh, website, there's actually a, a section on there on how patients can advocate for themselves, what to do in the event of a uh, you're out of network or just a straight denial. There's great resources for our patients. And, you know, I often say it, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a cheesy saying, but the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, one great example I have is that we had two Penn students. Um, the Penn, as you know, some school insurances aren't uh, very comprehensive in covering uh, very expensive procedures. Um, so I had one patient who, a uh, student kind of uh, laid back, wanted us to do most of the work for him. And, you know, we do the same amount of hard work for all of our patients, but at some point the patient has to advocate for themselves. And those that advocate are the ones that get what they need at a quicker and more efficient uh, rate. So the one patient who didn't advocate for themselves compared to the patient who did, uh, the second, uh, second patient went out to their um, school. They found who the medical director was uh, for their insurance plan at Penn. And that medical director reached out to their insurance company and said, you know, uh, kind of fought for them, wrote them a letter, and that patient got their surgery in three months versus the student who didn't advocate for themselves, had to wait 10 months uh, for implant uh, due to delays uh, incurred by insurance. Also one thing too, um, you should have the patients who work reach out to their employer. A lot of them have different funded plans, um, and a lot of them we treat a lot of teachers, um, or patients who have unions. A union can be a great way for the uh, patient to have another source to advocate for them for why they need the surgery and um, why it's important to, to them. Um, so the last thing I know, I kept talking about the website. It's a great resource uh, for approvals. Oftentimes, uh, I, I recently talked about patella. Patella lesions are actually not on policy for um, many uh, patients who um, who don't have the teller defects. So there's great literature on the website to support uh, why uh, patellas are doing great. I think uh, we've been having patellas approved. It's been FDA approved for the patella since uh, December 2016, I believe. Um, and, you know, it's, again, a great resource for uh, all information uh, regarding Macy and things help patients, things help us with approval and your surgeons. Um, another thing, too, uh, important resources to educate our patients about Macy. Um, there's a lot of uh, pamphlets and stuff that printed material that we have in the office. I actually use that little knee model in clinic. It's got some, uh, some defects on there to kind of help uh, patients who need more of a visual uh, to explain what a cartilage defects are. Um, Varicel provides all these resources to help educate our patients, and I um, 
kind of harp on the website too, Macy.com. There's a section for patients and there's a section for us as healthcare providers. Um, it puts it in great uh, layman's terms for our patients to kind of uh, what they can expect following, um, you know, uh, this surgery, um, what is a cartilage defect, uh, and, you know, how, how this surgery helps you get back to doing the things that you like to do, um, and what some things to expect while you're preparing for surgery. So, uh, kind of in summary, we know that cartilage defects don't heal on their own. They're a little problem is going to become a bigger problem, and we wouldn't want our patients to get, uh, become unamenable for the procedure. Um, uh, my cartilage care is a tremendous uh, source of resources to help our patients. It's got all the materials that help with approval, and it's also uh, a good source of uh, information regarding the procedure. And, um, you know, Macy is a great procedure. It shows long-lasting pain relief and improvement in function uh, for up to five years, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent procedure uh, for patients to use their own cells um, to repair these cartilage defects and um, a great treatment for them to get back to a healthy um, and active lifestyle. And then the last part of the presentation, I can't harp enough that uh, we are great uh, advocates for our patients, um, that, you know, patients do have to be advocates for themselves. And, you know, the end goal is making sure that we can get our patients implanted and back to the kind of things that they like to do. So thanks for listening to me today. I'm happy to take any questions uh, now. Um, and I'll also provide my email at the end of the questions. If you guys have any questions outside of the talk or you forgot to ask, uh, happy to talk about them. I uh, love talking about Macy. So I think there is a, a question here. Uh, surgeons not using Macy yet. How do you treat peripheral lesions hard to reach during an arthroscopy? So, um, you know, uh, that, that definitely is hard. There are a lot of lesions on the, the condyle that are hard to get back there. Um, obviously, um, hyperflexion uh, and trying to get the best chondroplasty you can during that surgery is, is one thing to do. Um, other than that, you know, uh, I would say Macy actually is probably the best for reaching those super peripheral lesions. Um, but I don't have a, a, a great treatment other than chondroplasty during an arthroscopy uh, to, to treat those symptomatic peripheral lesions. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, getting that patient set up for Macy probably is the best thing to do. There just are some lesions that we really can't reach with the shaver um, and, are, and are hard to reach. So one thing I uh, may have not uh, mentioned is that when do I introduce Macy to patients? I would say uh, I actually start to talk about Macy the, uh, the minute that I identify a lesion that's, that I know is going to be over two centimeters squared. So um, I don't get into uh, in like heavy detail that second procedure, but I think patients need to know what they're signing up for, um, especially our younger patients who do not wish to use allograph and want to move forward with their own cells. I talk to them actually at the time when we sign them up for biopsy. I let them know um, that, you know, this lesion is big. They're likely going to be amenable uh, to implantation down the road. Um, so I actually start talking to them um, before the biopsy. And um, if they ask, I provide them with the physical therapy protocol. I think that's a great way uh, for patients to be um, uh, uh, ready for the Macy procedure. And then after the biopsy um, is probably when I talk about Macy more heavily uh, because we have a visual picture. We print all of our arthroscopy photos for the patient. They can actually see the lesion, and I think it kind of starts to make more sense. Again, I'll have you a copy of the protocol that I use in the office, um, and that's when we'll start to talk uh, to patients. But I would definitely say I start mentioning it um, before we even operate them on operate on these patients uh, at the first visit um, and kind of, uh, you know, I make my, uh, not everybody does this and it's not for everybody, I make my email available to patients because a lot of people aren't going to have uh, all their questions in the office, they're going to forget a lot of things. So um, I think starting to talk about it at the first uh, before biopsy uh, is critical to get patients prepared. I have another question here. Auto. Well, as you know, um, you know, I think Macy is great for these peripheral lesions because, um, you know, we really can't use osteochondral autograph in our patients whose defects are larger than two centimeters squared. 
Um, and I think that it's also very hard. We'd be borrowing too much cartilage from the trochlea or another, uh, you know, non-critical part of the knee to, to fit into the defect. You know, the, the collagen membrane is super flexible. Um, and, you know, even when you hyperflex uh, the patient, um, you can get back to those peripheral areas. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's a great way to treat those peripheral lesions. By using MACI on very peripheral defects, it's an excellent way to get those posterior aspects of the condyle because now in this third generation product, all we have to do is glue it. Um, you don't necessarily need to throw a suture back there like you did with the second generation product where you had to sew all the way around the collagen membrane. So uh, MACI is an excellent way to cover the entire span of the defect. So excellent, uh, excellent question and uh, excellent treatment for those uh, hard-to-reach lesions. Question, oh, here we go. Uh, so have we had a patient uh, not successful uh, with Macy? That's a great question, and yes, you know, there are patients who uh, don't do well. Um, it's only happened, I think, once or twice to us, but I will say that was in um, a knee that had a lot of things going on. Um, so that particular patient that I'm thinking of also had, um, you know, uh, meniscal transplant and another alignment surgery, and um, for whatever reason, the Macy just didn't take. There was a lot of bony signal behind uh, the Macy implant, and I would say that's in the rarity. Uh, like I said, I've only seen it happen once, um, and it was with other contaminant pathology that we tried to, to, to do. Um, you know, we often call this a, a red knee. I like that term because it's the knee that has multiple problems going on. It also may be your older patient, maybe late 40s, early 50s, um, that we're kind of using it to help, uh, I call it biological uh, salvage for the knee. Uh, we want to push off knee replacement, and this defect is still focal, but the environment of the knee just wasn't um, as healthy as you would have in a green knee, which is a patient that just has one focal articular cartilage defect that we're treating with Macy. We got to it right away. This patient was also not successful with uh, Macy, had waited uh, some time with the pain. So um, not, not to say that, and this was, you know, over a long time. Uh, you know, we went in for a second arthroscopy, and the Macy actually looked great. It integrated well. It filled the defect well, but the patient still had pain. So I suppose you would consider that um, a failure or being unsuccessful. And, uh, you know, we can only do uh, as best as we can. It may look great on MRI. It may look great at time of second arthroscopy, um, but their, their side effect was persistent pain. It wasn't any, necessarily any mechanical symptoms, uh, but their biggest side effect was just persistent pain in the location of the defect. And like I said, this was an old, a little bit older patient, and we had to send them on uh, to talk to a patient about, uh, to talk to another surgeon about a possible uh, unicompartmental arthroplasty in that region. But yes, persistent pain. Um, if there aren't any other uh, additional questions, uh, we can wrap it up. I'll let it go for another 30 seconds or so. But um, if nobody has any additional questions, uh, thanks so much for listening. My email is available. Uh, it was put in the uh, uh, presenter, the audience chat. Um, again, please don't feel free. Uh, please feel free uh, to email me. Um, don't be shy with your questions. I love talking about Macy. I think it's a, again a great product for our patients who want to get back uh, to an active lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much. Indication for use. Macy, autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane, is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed by an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of Macy administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimetre squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use Effectiveness of Macy in joints other than the knee has not been established. 
safety and effectiveness of MACI in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. MACI is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other aminoglycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. MACI is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. MACI is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months, excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a MACI implant. MACI is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of MACI in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with MACI are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and MACI implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the MACI product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of MACI. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The MACI implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of MACI in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for MACI greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for MACI were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.